Hello everyone, cześć. Uh, I'm David Dvorak, I work at AV System. Uh, I'll have the pleasure to talk about uh, our experiences with using Scala.js on production. Uh, namely about Udash framework uh, as it approaches the first stable release. Uh, a little bit about me, um, I've been working with Scala for four years now. Um, I have been fortunate enough to have Scala as my first language. So when I first started working, we were already using Scala and it stuck, so that was nice. Uh, uh, I worked on device management uh, in large scale, mostly distributed systems, uh, a little bit of Internet of Things and machine to machine. Uh, I also worked at Google on mobile location and now I'm working on, on leading the monitoring team at AV System. We're doing Kafka streams, so we can cl clearly say that I'm not the right person to talk about frontend, but th that makes me the best person to lead this framework, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, so, uh, why did we actually want to use uh, a single language for doing web application? Uh, to understand this, you have to know that uh, around five years ago, most of our web applications in AV system uh, were done using Vadin. For those of you who know Vadin, uh, it is a great framework for quick prototyping when you want to have a seamless experience with just Java. Uh, so as long as your um, web applications are very simple, you only have vertical, horizontal layouts, grid layouts, buttons, forms, stuff like that, uh, you can really just uh, do it swing style and uh, present the data to your users and you're going to be fine. But at some point, uh, we understood that uh, we cannot move forward with that. Uh, we needed to interact with JavaScript libraries. We needed to do responsive web design. Uh, we needed uh, to do reactive web design. And uh, because of that, w we still wanted to keep uh, the properties that we, have, we had from using a single language, uh, whether it was Java or Scala. Uh, so we really wanted to have shared data model which can be a blessing and a curse when you're doing a web application because uh, it's very easy to uh, shoot DB calls from button listeners, which we did in Vadin and it was bad. <laughs> it wasn't testable. Uh, so we wanted to do it better, but we still wanted to share some data and share some code, um, namely the parts of the application logic that are cross-cutting concerns, uh, some validation, authentication, permissions, um, stuff like that. And we wanted to make sure at compile time that our protocols between the backend and the frontend are, were compatible. Uh, so that was something that we had uh, out of the box with Vadim. Uh, and uh, since most of our developers were backend Scala developers, uh, we wanted uh, both frontend and backend developers to still be very flexible and be able to contribute both and understand both the frontend and backend code. Um, so we thought using a single language is great, so we were not the first to think about that. Uh, no JS, right? Right? <laughs> but that's probably not the best way to do it, uh, as it turned out. Um, because obviously JavaScript is not that great when you think about it. The, uh, weird things can happen, and that was something that we really didn't want to have in our code. Uh, so we've decided that we need a typed language, right? So how about TypeScript, right? TypeScript is a great language for front-end development, but uh, it wasn't uh, strongly typed enough for us. Um, the types were optional, and even the issue that we've seen on the previous slide uh, wouldn't be solved by using TypeScript. We could more easily debug this, because we would know from the type of the callback that this was not exactly what we wanted to do, uh, but obviously there are better languages to run your backend on than Node.js, right? I guess you guys can think of some JVM languages that, that you like more, or Rust, or whatever. <laughs> Anything is better than JS on the backend, right? Uh, so we decided that we want to go with the language that, that we really know, that we understand, uh, with the IDE that we know, with, the, with a single seamless experience, and for us, that was Scala. So what we did, we, we, we typed Scala.js into, into the browser, and we found out that there is something like that. Uh, so for how many of you have used Scala.js? Great. I'm not going to bore you to death. 
<laughs> okay, a quick primer on Scala.js. Scala.js allows you to compile your Scala code to JavaScript. And this is not a subset of the language. It's any Scala code can compile to JavaScript with this. Um, this is a Scala compiler plugin. You can generate some additional files that are needed for this. Um, and there, there's, there's a whole ecosystem coming with it. Uh, first and foremost, there's a linker and optimizer, um, which uh, transform the, JS file, the Scala files into JS files and then optimize the output. There's an, the most common way to integrate with Scala.js is via SBT plugin, but if you use other build tools, then you can also do that. Um, the coolest thing about Scala.js is it has incremental compilation support. Otherwise, it wouldn't be really possible to uh, implement front-end with it. You wouldn't want your front-end to take as long to, com uh, to compile as your back-end does, right, in Scala. Uh, so if you just modify the few lines uh, and you want to have a quick feedback loop, it's fine. Scala.js is going to compile that in one to two seconds. So it is enough and you can run it continuously in, uh, in SBT. It will detect changes and compile in the background whenever you change something. So, so it's pretty great uh, for developer experience. All the pure Scala libraries work out of the box. You can compile anything. Uh, as long as it's cross-compilable. Uh, parts of, uh, of the Java standard library don't work, obviously. The file access, JNI, you cannot do that in, uh, in JavaScript. Uh, and also there's uh, everything from Java standard library has to be re-implemented for Scala.js. Uh, and that's an ongoing process. There are obviously some licensing issues with Oracle. Uh, so if you do as much as look at OpenJDK code, you cannot really implement uh, Java library for Scala, but uh, people do that. And uh, the, the parts that are mostly missing are, are probably date formats and people work around that in, uh, with some Scala libraries. But other than that, it's pretty great. Um, you can interact with native JavaScript libraries either dynamically uh, like you would write uh, untyped uh, JavaScript, or you can use typed wrappers. And you can also expose the code you wrote in Scala to uh, JavaScript users uh, via global exports of JS modules. So the regular compilation pipeline can be summed up like this. You, get, you have Scala files, you run them through Scala C, you get the class files, and then you can put them in the jar uh, if, you're, if you're releasing a library or, or, running a, or creating a fat jar. Uh, with Scala.js, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, in addition to class files, uh, you get uh, Scala.js intermediate representation, which contains uh, additional information needed by the Scala.js linker to create the JavaScript files. Uh, the, this representation can be either in your uh, targets or in jar files. So then the linker can take uh, the libraries and, uh, and the sources to create a single JavaScript file uh, and a source map file for, uh, for debugging uh, in Scala in the browser. So you can actually put uh, breakpoints in the browser in Scala code and it will work. Uh, this is where the development uh, build cycle usually uh, ends. Uh, unless you're running a production build, then you want your code to be as small as possible. So in this case, it's run uh, via the Google Closure compiler as well. And it produces much smaller, around 10 to, to 15 times smaller code. Uh, and usually it's small enough to, to ship it to prod. I'm going to show some applications later on. Uh, a typical project structure for web application on the, uh, built with Scala.js looks like that. Uh, there's the regular server sources on the JVM, uh, which can depend on JVM libraries. Uh, it's just regular Scala code. Then, there in, then we have the shared sources, uh, which are available both from the server and from the client side and compiled to uh, class files and uh, JavaScript respectively. Uh, those sources can depend on cross-compiled libraries only. Um, and with some, um, with, with some exclusions from that rule, because there can be some, some classes implemented natively for JVM and JS if you really need to use some API, but you still want to have that in short, shared sources. 
Uh, and then there's the front-end code, uh, which can depend both on Scala JS shared and shared libraries and on pure JS libraries. And this is shipped to the browser. The communication between the server and the client is whatever you want it to be. Uh, Ajax, WebSockets, Fetch, uh, you code it. Um, and you can also create uh, an application that's only front-end sources if you want it to be. Uh, that's not only for browser-only applications. I've seen people do, uh, for example, uh, applications for uh, running lambdas in the cloud. Uh, when they were working with a lambda uh, with a cloud provider which only accepted JavaScript and Python lambdas, for example, they were writing Scala, then compiling that to JavaScript, and then running it as JavaScript lambdas. It worked. So uh, it's it's yet another target for Scala and. Uh, this uh, structure and, uh, is, is very similar to how you would run Scala Native, if you know it. Uh, and cross-compiled projects for, for Scala can run Scala JS and Scala Native as well. Uh, but if you're running in the browser, you probably want to interact with the DOM. Uh, and the most important thing in the DOM is the HTML tags. Uh, the most idiomatic way to do that in Scala.js is Scala Tags Library by Lee Hoi. Um, it's a template rendering engine which can be used uh, both on the back end and on the front end. So you can render the tags uh, uh, server side if you want it uh, into an index, into a, an HTML file. Uh, the tags look like that. Uh, you can use any Scala constructs in there. Uh, it's it's type safe. Uh, you're not going to make an error in the tags. Uh, and then you can render, render that directly into the body or uh, you can create an HTML file from it. Uh, the IDE is going to help you a lot when you're using Scala tags uh, and if you not know frontend like I do. Um, so you're not going to make stupid mistakes uh, and you're going to get nice documentation in the IDE right from the MDN. Uh, once you have the tags, you probably want to have some styles. Uh, the most common library for that is Scala CSS. Uh, we're not exactly using Scala CSS in Udash, but I'm going to talk about that later. Um, Scala CSS provides a DSL for creating standalone and inline style sheets. Uh, it's also fully type checked, but it uses macros very heavily. Um, and then you can uh, apply those styles uh, directly into your Scala tags nodes. Um, this will render into, into a body with a style and then uh, respective classes added to the nodes. If you have questions, you can ask in, in <laughs> between the presentation because I, I can see you guys are already confused a little bit. <laughs> and with Scala CSS, uh, you're also uh, getting nice uh, syntax suggestions. Uh, and uh, like if you want to, and the attributes are fully typed, if you have to use a color, it's going to tell you that you're adding a string there and it's wrong. And you can override it all because sometimes you have to in JavaScript, but uh, usually you can use the typed APIs. And it would seem that we can write the front end application with this, right? It should be enough, but uh, we know that uh, usually in the front that we're, we're used to using frameworks, and those frameworks provide a little bit more than we've seen here. Uh, the thing that we're missing from modern uh, front-end frameworks are data bindings, uh, some routing, uh, means to communicate between the client and the server, uh, maybe some internationalization. Uh, this is something that Angular or React or Vue would provide for you uh, out of the box. So this is where Udash comes in, and it's supposed to fill those gaps in an opinionated way. Um, funny story about the name. I, I don't think anyone ever said why the name is <laughs> so weird. Uh, uh, the name has a weird connotation in Polish, right? Because it sounds like Judas. Uh, so <laughs> it's because the, the employee that first started the idea of doing front-end in this way left right after he finished the framework. <laughs> so the name stuck and yeah, we're still developing it. We're actually continuing the trend. We have an uh, internal component library based on Udash called Janusz, also via SH. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> you're the first to know. Uh, Udash framework is actually uh, a series of modules, uh, mostly independent. 
Uh, you can choose uh, what you want to what you actually want to use. There's the color module, uh, which is just for the front end. Uh, there's the CSS module. There's uh, a uh, WebSocket-based RPC. There's an alternative to this RPC based on REST. And some uh, small modules, extend, we call them extensions for bootstrap internationalization, authorization, stuff like that. Uh, all is completely optional. Um, you can just use core, and that's fine, or just RPC. Uh, and there's going to be a whole another talk about REST. So that's just something. Uh, Let's get started. Uh, U-Core, as I said, is directed uh, at front-end application development. There have been some uh, attempts to use, uh, for example, data bindings on the JVM, but uh, they were not written um, with uh, JVM threads in mind. It's much easier to keep something thread safe in JavaScript, right? Uh, and uh, its uh, goal is to allow for typeful web development. So everything is covered in types, and you don't have to worry about JavaScript anymore. Uh, whatever is async, we try to keep it async. Uh, and uh, all of U-Core is written in pure Scala.js. There, there are no external JS dependencies. Uh, it supports uh, an architectural pattern similar to Model View Presenter, but it doesn't really uh, influence you too much, so you can run MVC and VVM, or put everything in a single class, and it's still going to work. So that's, that's fine. But it helps if you really want to structure your application. Uh, starting with the first and most common mechanism, properties. Uh, these are used for data bindings. Uh, properties let you modify um, parts of your model. And there are different kinds of properties available, simple properties, model properties, which have sub-properties, sub-sequences, and sub-models. And uh, there are sequence properties which accept patches, so we can replace something in the middle. Uh, and those properties uh, can be based on traits or classes or whatever you like. They're obviously inherently mutable, uh, but you want to mutate, so that's fine. Uh, a simple example would be like you would see in AngularJS. Uh, two-way binding between an input and, uh, and the text node. Whatever you write here is going to change in the text. And it's pretty simple to do. Uh, so you can, you can nest your, uh, your models however you like. Uh, and we're doing a little bit of macros to allow for that, uh, but we're trying to restrict it as much as possible. Uh, those bindings. Uh, allow for transformations, not only listening and, and binding. You can, uh, as you can see here, uh, the sequence of doubles it is transformed to a sequence of integers. A reverse transformation is also provided, so the int sequence is still immutable. Uh, if you change something in the int sequence, it's going to change the, the underlying double. Um, the ints can be filtered as well, as we can see. Uh, there's a lot of uh, other utils if you need them. Uh, and this pattern is obviously known from other libraries as uh, reactive variables, uh, reactive data bindings. Uh, and uh, it allows us to only re-render the parts of the DOM that we really need to re-render. We can bind only to a small uh, part of the model, and we're not going to uh, re-render all, all the web page every time something changes. Uh, so the next mechanism is routing. Uh, routing is based either on URL path or fragment. Fragment is the thing after the hash. Um, it resolves the application state from the URL. So you can, you can think of the state as, as, the, as a database query, anything you need to recreate the view. Uh, and then uh, from the state, it resolves uh, corresponding view and presenter. Uh, you can decide whether the view and presenter will be recreated or whether you can reuse some of those that you had already. Um, and this is an example of, of such a routing. Uh, you can see that we're using a macro here, bidirectional. Uh, this is one of the things that I'm going to show from another uh, AV system library, the Scala Commons. Uh, the bidirectional macro basically swaps the side of, sides of the, of the pattern match. So uh, you get two partial functions. 
uh, from it to, to have bidirectional binding. And you can imagine that using apply and on apply, you can add some crazy things to this. It can do like uh, URL encoding or, or some marshalling inside here. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're interested, uh, I really recommend checking the Scala Commons library. If you're doing macros, serialization, RPCs, if you need a really fast Redis client or, or are using Spring, then there's definitely something for you. Uh, I think of Scala Commons a little bit less as I think about Finagle. Like Twitter doesn't really advertise it that much, but there are a lot of production ready libraries there. And it's the same for Scala Commons. We use it in, in all our products. And a lot of you, that's just based on whatever is there. And about the MVP part, um, the, the, as I said, it's not very it doesn't have very strict requirements. Uh, the view only has to create the template to render. Uh, and the presenter has to be able to handle uh, application state changes. So you could pack that into, into a single class if you like and, and then have uh, a single component or you, could, you can blow it into as many classes as you, as you like. And there's the view factory which decides whether we have to create a new view and presenter. Um, Internally, we don't really use the, the more known MVP passive view mode where the presenter is uh, handling all the communication between the model and the view. Uh, we're using the supervising controller version where the view interacts with the model via data bindings and those are our properties. Uh, we try to use the data bindings as much as we can. Uh, and the presenter is more for business logic and handling the communication with the server. Uh, if, and obviously, we're using this uh, structure to enable uh, testing those components. Uh, and testing is very much possible in Scala.js. You can use Scala test, you can use Scala mock, you can use Scala check, whatever you like. And then run those tests either in Node.js, uh, which is fine, but then the interactions with the DOM are harder. Uh, or you can use Scala.js and Selenium. Um, and this project allows you to reuse the Selenium web driver and then run your tests in whatever browser you like. Uh, this also works in Travis and we're using it for, for testing Udash. Udash RPC, the second module, um, I think the most used one. Um, it is uh, a client-server communication system which uh, works uh, bidirectionally, so you can send calls from the server to the client, from the client to the server. Uh, via web sockets. All the communications are asynchronous uh, and they return futures. Um, the protocol is based on shared uh, code traits. Uh, and then the uh, client and the server is uh, generated by macros. Um, all the correctness in, this, in those traits is verified in compile time. Uh, so you're not going to have any errors, including the serialization part. Uh, the usage is very simple for the, for the calling side. It's just a method called and it, and it returns a future. Uh, actually, the whole U-RPC RPC is based on an RPC framework from Scala Commons, which allows you to create any framework, not just WebSocket and future framework, but you can, you can customize as much as you like. Um, and uh, yeah, I already said about WebSockets. That's how an uh, U-RPC RPC interface looks. Um, an RPC can uh, have three types of methods. Uh, it can return another RPC, which doesn't fire anything. Uh, it can return a future, which uh, means that there's going to be a call to the server side or the client side. Uh, and uh, it can return unit, which means this is a fire and forget call, and we shouldn't expect, expect a response. Uh, all of this is uh, serialized via our gen codec library which allows to, to derive uh, all the serialization type classes for mostly anything here. So, so there's not much uh, custom code to write for serialization or, or anything. Uh, the calls look like this. So once you have the server RPC, uh, you're just calling it, you're getting uh, a future and then you can work with it. Uh, on the Scala.js side, uh, the default execution context is the JSQ. And the server side call looks like this. You can either send something to, to all clients or to a specific client ID. Uh, the implementations of, of those interfaces look 
are just straight implementations. You don't really need to do anything more. You does CSS. I already mentioned that we don't really use Scala CSS, but we use Scala CSS DSL. Uh, we just don't like the code generated by the macros uh, because it's really huge. And basically, Scala CSS generates J Scala code, which then generates CSS on the front end, which increases the JS size greatly. And then, uh, in addition to the fact that the JavaScript file is large, the initial uh, render is much uh, takes much more time than it would if it was a separate CSS file. After all, browsers are used to having uh, separate CSS files. So what we do is we reuse the Scala CSS DSL, but uh, we changed it a little bit, so the styles are in shared code, uh, but the only part of the style that ever gets to the front-end side is the class name. You're using it in a type-safe way, and then based on the same class names and the definition of the styles, there's a back-end side renderer which can um, render files during compilation or during application startup or on request if you want to customize your styles for each client. Uh, it's up to you to choose. And this way, uh, we're getting much smaller JavaScript size. Uh, if I remember correctly, the uh, U-Dash guide web page, uh, actually the U-Dash framework web page, uh, reduced its size by over 30% just by switching to uh, U-Dash CSS, which is a great result. Uh, U-Dash REST, I'm not gonna talk too much about it. Um, initially, because there's a second talk about it, uh, initially, um, it was an embedded client which allowed you to write the RPC traits and then use an external REST API if you wanted. Um, then we added server-side support because some of our teams wanted to have uh, REST APIs. They then didn't want to have separate APIs for their UDARS application and some other applications that they had. Um, now it evolved into an independent uh, REST library it has uh, open API support, generates uh, Swagger files, and uh, it's, uh, it has two great qualities. If you just have a trait, it works. It's seamless to use. Uh, if you want to customize it, you can have a million annotations, and you have what you want. Uh, so if you just want to write your web applications fully you dash, then you don't need to do anything. If you need to wrap an external uh, REST API, you can definitely do that. If you want to customize everything, uh, it's also possible, and I think Roman is going to show that later on. Uh, and now moving on to the extension modules, U dash Bootstrap. That's something that uh, I think external library users use the most. Uh, it's a thin wrapper over Twitter Bootstrap, and it allows to use Bootstrap components uh, in a way that resembles Swing, I guess. Uh, so you have just listeners, some, some component classes, and that's it. And you can embed that into your uh, templates. Uh, it's, uh, and this, uh, this simple component where you push the button, something gets randomly disabled. If you click something, it's appended to the list. Looks like this. So you just have some buttons. Uh, you specify the styles. You specify what's, what's going to be in there. You have a, a simple property, a simple button. You, you handle the listener. And, and that's it. And the whole template is just, uh, just the last four lines. So it's I'm going to say it's, it's pretty easy to use. I use it a lot in, in my personal projects, uh, even though internally we have our own component library written purely in Scala. Uh, but that's something that uh, we want to publish later on. Once we agree on the API, it's always a problem. Uh, another module, uh, U-internationalization. Uh, it allows to define um, sh uh, the translation keys in the shared code. Uh, they have type safe parameters. You can see that there is a, a key with a single argument, uh, which is an integer. Uh, then you can use your uh, good old uh, Java resource bundles if you want, or you can use a front end translation module. And uh, those translations will be cached in the local storage. It will be fetched from the backend. It will handle different locales. And you can just bind them using the translated binding, uh, as you can see here, providing your arguments uh, on runtime. Other U-extensions, which I'm not going to talk too much about 
is the high charts wrapper, which uh, allows you to, to use high charts in Scala. Uh, same for jQuery. Uh, there are a few other uh, jQuery wrappers than ours, but I like ours the most. Uh, there's a user activity uh, module, which uh, enables tracking uh, uh, user navigation through the app and uh, and what calls are made to the backend. Uh, there's a U-dash uh, authorization module, which uh, I can actually show. Uh, it's uh, you, you have some permissions defined in uh, in the shared code. Uh, the backend is obviously the source of what permission you of what permissions user has. You can combine the permissions. You can say that uh, the user needs to have all of them or any of them or uh, or something, and then uh, then you can use this require binding, uh, which will hide the elements of the DOM depending on the uh, on the permissions the user has currently. And there are uh, similar utilities for blocking the backend calls because obviously someone could change the JavaScript and, and still see the span. Uh, but yeah, you, s you still have to verify the permissions on the backend. Uh, now I'm going to show you a few of the U Dash applications that we've developed for our customers uh, over the time. U Dash has been used in production for three years now, I think. Uh, the first application, uh, well, when we first brought it, was was similar to to AV system. It was similar to bringing Scala to a Java shop. Like there were a lot of different things uh, coming out of this Trojan horse. Uh, in our case, it, it wasn't final tagless, fortunately, but uh, but there were a lot of other Scala things, and we're not bringing it to JavaScript, but to to the JavaScript side, which was even more uh, even more of a contrast. Um, and that was actually self-management was the first application that was our initial use case for Udash, because mostly at AV System we were doing applications that were used uh, by huge telco providers. Uh, they were using it for customer care, for administration, for monitoring. And there weren't that many users. They were using them on, on strong PCs. We didn't have to care about the application size, about responsiveness, uh, about anything, actually. So Vadin was great. Uh, but for self-management, our client wanted to use parts of our device management application and expose them to the end user. So whenever internet was down, they would enter it, and they would enter it on the phone. So this had to scale a little bit. Uh, since it was our first application, maybe not the most beautiful, but this is the application written in U-0.1. Uh, we've obviously updated it since then. but uh, And that's how it looks on the phone. So, so we kind of managed. Uh, it was 2015, I think. Uh, so that's how responsive web design looked done. Uh, the application is 9K lines of code. Uh, this uh, compiles to one and a half megabyte of JS and one and three megabytes of JavaScript dependencies. Um, could be better. We're now restricting JavaScript dependencies as much as we can. Uh, but this was one of, the, one of the first apps, so we didn't really know what we are doing. Uh, the monitoring application is something that my team is currently working on, and this is something that the client uses to monitor lines in customer care and quickly respond to the fact that some of the services may be down. Um, this application has some search, the list, um, it has uh, 12k lines of code, it compares to 1.8 megabytes of JS and 700 kilobytes of JavaScript dependencies. Uh, it's going to go down to around 400, I think, uh, once we g get Atmosphere out, uh, which we're working on. Uh, and there are also dashboards. Uh, all data is coming from the monitoring live. You can refresh the data. Um, there are also high charts in there. Um, and we also have a reporting module, which is a spoiler to another um, AV system library. Uh, here the report fields are defined uh, in runtime uh, and what the user defines is actually Scala code. Uh, this is our uh, Scala expression evaluation engine. Uh, think Spring uh, expression language if you know it, but 10 times faster. Uh, so the user uh, can use any Scala APIs that, that we expose to him. 
uh, to define the fields, define the filters, and this is something that we use across AV system applications. And uh, Scala turned out to be a great language to do that. The user can just add two columns and convert them to string, then map them, and it works fine. Uh, and if they can do it, uh, they pay us to do it. So it's OK, and we don't have to do much development. Uh, there's a link to this library, but uh, I don't think it's very greatly documented <laughs> yet. <laughs> but I encourage, uh, encourage the author, who's going to talk later, uh, to, to promote it more. Uh, <laughs> now moving on to, to the next app, the uh, Coyote IoT Data Orchestration. Uh, it's one of our flagship applications. Uh, the clients use it to, uh, it pr and probably that's the biggest Sudash application that we've ever shipped. Uh, the clients use it to integrate multiple data sources and then display the data around about IoT devices on dashboards, on maps, on charts, uh, do some monitoring, uh, uh, do asset inventory. Uh, and there are also workflows uh, based on uh, the changes in, in that asset data. So all of the things that I'm showing you here, the dashboards, are completely customizable and, and the user just drag and drops them on, on this dashboard. This is around 60k lines of code in, on the front end. Uh, that compiles to almost 4 megabytes of JavaScript and 1.5 megabytes of JavaScript dependencies. So we can see that compared to the, the previous uh, app, which was 12K uh, and, and one and a half megabyte, it scales pretty well. Once you get all the Scala standard library into your JavaScript, then, then it's fine. Uh, and as I said, uh, you can drag and drop those dashboards. You can configure what data sources are there, what charts, uh, periods, everything. So, so this is all configured in runtime. And now the time has come for the most important application of today, the application that you can uh, create in five minutes right now or when you come home. Um, you can just uh, type svt new dash framework with dash g8 and that's gonna run the jitter8 uh, template engine, uh, which is included in svt 0.13.13, I think, and later. So we're probably using it for a year now or more. And this will spin up a chat application for you with permissions for reading and writing messages, with internationalization, uh, with a login page. So um, it's, it's a great uh, seed for web applications based on Udash. Uh, and if you want to see how, how a small application uh, built using the framework looks, that's, that's probably the way to go. Uh, this application is uh, over 1,000 lines of front-end code and compares to 600 kilobytes JavaScript. And obviously, uh, by using such a bleeding edge technology, uh, we had to expect issues. Um, and the, the biggest source of issues for us was uh, obviously JavaScript and interacting with native JavaScript. Uh, when you're doing that using the dynamic interface, you can write anything in there. It's going to accept it. Uh, like you can see there's a typo in the, in the call in here. Uh, this typo is still going to compile in JavaScript, and then you're going to have an error on runtime. And this is something that uh, you can avoid using the typed wrappers, which you may or may not have to write uh, if you're lucky. Uh, and then once you use the typed interface, you're safe uh, on compile time. Those typed interfaces can come from multiple sources. There are obviously some user-written facades, which are uh, more extensive than what we see here. And uh, actually, the Scala.js React facade is the most popular way, other than Udash, to write uh, Scala.js frontend, and a lot of companies use it. Uh, but there are also ways to easily generate such wrapper automatically from TypeScript wrappers. There's a tool to do that. Uh, there's actually the, a whole website, definitely Scala, which converted all definitely typed TypeScript, TypeScript wrappers to Scala.js wrappers. And there has, uh, there's an, uh, the, the Scalably typed uh, repo is a new repository where someone uh, created a new importer from TypeScript and improved some things that were lacking in the, uh, in the definitely Scala uh, wrappers. Uh, so it's very promising. 
uh, also, if you have to, you can easily write it. There's not that much code. And if you have uh, documentation for, for the JS library, it's pretty easy. Uh, and once you have a type wrapper, you're going to have a compile error, which is much better. Uh, the other problem that you could possibly expect is the JavaScript size. Uh, for Scala compiled to JavaScript, we use that code elimination and works great. Uh, all the Scala standard library code, uh, Java standard library code is almost never shipped with the application. But obviously, uh, the DC doesn't duplicate reachable code. If something is generated and can be called, then it's going to be in there. Uh, and there are a few possible sources of such code that you might eliminate. Scala CSS was one of them, so we don't use it anymore. Uh, another issue that we had was with uh, Scala's object, uh, objects, because in some browsers, like Edge and Internet Explorer, who would have guessed, uh, were not properly initialized lazily. So if you had something in an object, then it would be initialized on App Startup, and your application would never start. Uh, so that was pretty bad. Other than this, uh, Scala.js performance is on par with JavaScript. In worst cases, two times slower, which is not that bad. Um, but we've eliminated a few other sources of generated code in Scala. Uh, for some of our front-end uh, data classes, we use tricks like this. So we prevent the Scala compiler from generating uh, methods in case classes. And instead, we delegate. And delegation is great for, uh, for not generating additional code. It doesn't work exactly the same as, as the original code, but it's, it's fine enough uh, for what we want to do with our data classes on the front end. Uh, also, we have to avoid micro-materialized code as much as we can. Uh, so it doesn't get duplicated. Uh, we usually use uh, companions in, in, in the objects, which will cache uh, the type class instances created by dev macros. So there's only a single place where they can be found and uh, where, where they are generated. Uh, and for class encoding, uh, we avoid uh, unnecessary classes a lot of the times for enums, which there are a lot of them in, uh, on the front end. Uh, people use ADTs, and that creates a class for the trade, for all the case objects, a lot of other methods that you might not need, especially if you have uh, the same fields in all your objects. So we created our own way to encode uh, value enums, and this resembles the Java enums more, and also provides uh, additional functionalities which are found in Java enums, like uh, ordering guarantees and uh, a way to access a list of all the values of the enum. And obviously, we had problems with IDE support, like anyone using Scala. You can probably remember this issue with cats, where uh, you could wrap your code in a comment and it would work. Uh, so we had a similar issue with u-code. Uh, I don't know if you can see this correctly. Yeah, I think you can. Uh, the IOU dash import, this is an import from a companion object, didn't really always work. It's, it worked sometimes, and then it randomly stopped working, and then it worked again. Uh, so we had huge issues with that. It, it was a pain. Uh, and to fix that, you had to break the linter in IntelliJ. If you remove some of the braces, then it would start working again after it invalidated cache. Uh, we raised an issue with IntelliJ Scala. It got, it's gotten some traction, 25 likes, but it, was, it, it wasn't a low-hanging fruit, so they didn't do it. But finally, we did it. <laughs> we found the issue. And it turned out that in IntelliJ, the package objects uh, were cached independently of the module they were contained on. So if there wasn't an IOU-package uh, object uh, on the back end, then IntelliJ would remember that there is no IOU-package object. And when it went to the front-end code, it, just, it would just ignore it. So uh, now uh, they fixed that. It works in the current beta release, and it will work in the current stable release, uh, which is the end of this month, I think. And a little bit about the future, what we want to do before the final stable release. Uh, U-REST is included in the upcoming 0.8 release, which we're finishing this month. 
Uh, we've added support for other sequence types than the base sequence. Uh, initially, it was a decision to only support the base sequence because the underlying data structure is inherently mutable, so we didn't really want to say it may not be. Uh, but if someone wants to throw a vector in there, we're going to support it, even though there's uh, performance overhead. People want their, their data classes clean, independent of how slow it works. Uh, we're removing atmosphere to reduce the JavaScript dependency size. Uh, we're replacing that with a pure Scala.js with socket client implementation. And we're upgrading our Bootstrap uh, to Bootstrap 4 uh, for those of you who might want to use it. Uh, and uh, this is the first time I'm going to say it, but we're releasing 1.0 this year. Uh, the APIs are pretty stable right now. We're only cleaning up. Uh, we're not adding many new features. Uh, we just want to, to make this uh, as seamless for the users uh, as it can be, and we want to release, I think, fall this year. Um, and then we're not going to break backwards compatibility, I promise, for a while at least. Uh, <laughs> to sum up, uh, Scala.js on production is definitely possible. Uh, we did it. It worked. Uh, maybe if you're doing, a, I don't know, a Twitter mobile app, then uh, you really care that your app weighs 100 kilobytes. If you don't, and it can weigh 300 kilobytes, you'll be fine. Uh, types can be everywhere on the front end, and you don't really have to interact with uh, the untyped nature of, of the wild DOM. Um, it's very easy to uh, bootstrap a Scala.js application. Uh, most of the libraries provide uh, Gitterate templates, so you can start right away. Um, you can uh, build and develop such app within a single environment. You never switch IDE. Uh, you just use IntelliJ of or whatever you want, and then uh, the code will end up running in the JVM and, uh, and in the browsers uh, correspondingly. Uh, and then uh, you can just use Scala everywhere. And I think that's the goal for the people here who go to Krakow Scala user group. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, this is a link to, this, to these slides, uh, so you can use the other links that were in there. Uh, the u-io uh, page is an introduction to the u-dash framework. Uh, there's the u-dash guide application, which is an open source application uh, where all the concepts and features that I explained uh, are explained in more detail, and you can just copy the code and it will work. Uh, we have a Gitter channel uh, where us and even our users respond to questions, uh, which is nice. Uh, there's the Scala.js uh, web page uh, where you will find resources for all the amazing Scala.js libraries. Uh, and if you want to work with us, then check out where we're the best. Uh, I'm David, and you can find me on GitHub and Twitter. I think that's it. Thank you.